in the city and the Green Party in a very small room at the city. That was about school, um, 18 years ago or something like that. Um, so just to provide a bit of introduction of where I come from and the reason why I'm here, and for one of why I'm here is Peter asked for a host of um, that's answer one. But I also, for the Green Party, we have three members in both houses of parliament. Um, that is um, myself, Jenny Jones, my fellow Green here, and Caroline Lewis. Now we um, divide our percentage of all the three different world between us. Um, I'm most into international issues. Um, and in that international framework, um, I do everything from I'm the co-chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong. I do work against lethal autonomous weapons, commonly known as killer robots. Um, I believe that human rights and the law are indivisible and are attached to every human being on this planet. And I also very much the rights of nature. And I'm supporting the international criminal What we've traditionally seen in mainstream politics and in the UK and around the world is that human rights has been something we've used as a stick to beat people we don't like for other reasons. And our allies and friends, we've ignored their abuses of human rights. What I very much, very strongly believe is that um, these are individual rights applying to everyone. We've actually developed over the past few decades a very good framework of international human rights. That framework is there, but it's not being applied. And the starting point for applying it is to apply it equally around the world without fear or favour. And so they say this right of tax is good enough. Now, the practical reality I see there is three green members of the Houses of Parliament. We can't possibly do everything and deal with every issue that needs to be dealt with. What I prioritise are issues where the UK can have a particular role. But I think we all might want to be aware of what is happening around the world and to see where the UK could play a positive role. So, for example, one area that I've done a lot of work on over the years is uh, the issue of the UK arms sales in Saudi Arabia, which is something that I regard as a difficult media action on. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm very much looking forward to today to learn a great deal more about the issues of Kushistan. The title of today, Balash Lives Matter, that to me, there are so many different first places and, and people so we could put in that sentence. And they all deserve attention and action from the British government wherever we can. So that's starting out where I come from today. I think most people would probably see the agenda. So we've got a number of speakers. The schedule doesn't allow a lot of time for QA. I always believe that dialogue is better than monologue. So I'll probably squash my own time to allow a little bit more time for QA. That. Um, but I think that's probably enough of an introduction. I think that we've hopefully got everyone who's coming along here today and out here. So, what I'm going to do um, is hand the floor over. But before I do that, I'm also going to have to mention that you'll see, um, if you look at the screens behind you on the tree, not behind you, behind you'll see this green, this green bell going ding, ding, ding. If the red bell goes ding, 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 that means I have to go and watch. Um, so if that happens, uh, there will probably be a loud noise in this room and I'll dash out for a little while and I'll hand it up to Peter. And I apologise for that, but that's the um, So having done all of the housekeeping and with the introduction, I'm going to hand it now over to Dr. Nasir Dashti, um, from Tami, from the Gala Human Rights Council. Thank you. 
Since 2002, these sections have increased exponentially. The of the auxiliary militia takes part and religious offerings. Military and civil engineering positions are formed to force discipline and illegal detention of those interested in social responsibility and political activities and politics. Something learned that thousands of those special and political activists with digital masters and human subs are to become a key major position. Very high numbers of extraditary killed and missing persons in the last 15 years is 15,000. Nearly half a million people have been internally displaced. Thousands have fled the country and are in the cities and various countries. Why is all this happening in Balochistan? To understand that, understanding the context of the Balochistan relation with the after the Second World War, the British Empire the Jews from India, however, to safeguard the strategic and economic interests of the West from a Cold War perspective, it has to be implemented its long term strategy of dividing India to create a new country. For this, the colonial administration used the special strategy of the Muslim and India alienation. Officials of the colonial office of Asked the Quran for the rest of the big party to demolish straight out of India for the non existing nation of Islam. Amazingly, the Christians, the Buddhists, and Muslims of other religious faiths in India were not declared nations, and no state was created for them. The creation of Pakistan came out of the Guru for the region's nations, which were aspiring to be independent after the British withdrawal. Instead of the Balu, Sindhi, and Pashto, only there was a change of colonial master. They were incorporated against their will into the current state of the colonial power. Pakistan is a purposely created artisan state from a war perspective. This is perhaps a unique example of the world's political history. First, it's a unique and that the colonial institution picture the identity of this newly independent country. Second, it is unique because the party demanded independence was there's a command of Indian ladies of the colonial administration. Third, it is unique and that the leadership of the newly independent state was imported from Australia. Fourth, it is perhaps the only example and politicized history that Urdu. The declared national language was not the language of any nation of the newly independent country. With the state ideology of ignorance in the society, with the state itself facing a crisis of legitimacy, the establishment employed numerous social, cultural, political, and religious strategies to eliminate everything that might suggest a national picture for the state. The use of the state violence became necessary because the ruling Punjabis had nothing in common with the well which are the majority in Pakistan, except their religious faith. In this context, the state created a ramified military organization with its affiliated political and religious outfits compared to the national aspiration of the associated nation. In the wake of the Baloch withdrawal from India, the Baloch state, called the Khanet of Allah, declared independence on June 11, 1947. In an agreement called the Standstill Agreement, it signed on August 4, 1947. The future state of Pakistan denied the Khanet as an independent sovereign state. However, after nine months, it invaded and annexed the Baloch state on March 27, 1948. The forceful annexation of the state and various subdivision and assimilation strategies of Pakistan were unacceptable to the Baloch. As a result, the state adopted multiple strategies to counter the Baloch national aspiration, which resulted in many political and armed resistance movements with 
blood, blood shed. The school curriculum introduced by the state relatively predicated historical facts, human social values, and natural reality. The emphasis was on the fallacious concept of Islamic nationhood, negating all national uh, identities. The teaching of the Baluchi language is banned at schools. The notorious Baluchi and Sabin Barbados of the Middle Ages, who carried out acts of genocide of the Baluchi and other people of the population, are being portrayed as national heroes. The position of social and cultural values of the work of North Indian black migrants, who have cherished the most. One of the arguments about the situation is crazy. Firstly, the Baruch strategy regarding the religious belief is a religious problem. Religion was never politicalized by the Baruch and always permitted the first principle. However, to dilute the Baruch national religion, Pakistan is systematically adopted policies to introduce religion as a political factor in the society. The process of making the Baloch perfect Muslims began in the 1970s. Throughout Balochistan, the state established a group of mosques and religious schools. From these schools, various extremist religious groups were created to carry out subversive activities against Afghanistan and India and to be used in the target killing of Baloch nationalist activities. After the 9 11 incident in the US, the Pakistani establishment found the unconditional and all out support of the civilized world as an opportunity to complete its long term plan of doing away with the Baloch national question. In December 2005, the Pakistani ruler, Janet Gomez Mushafar, referring to the Baloch question, told the media and the that this time it will be refined to the finish. Consequently, the Baloch and Pakistani security forces. He came in war and then came down to Malaysia. As a result, a bloody and protected resistance movement began in Balochistan with threats of much color and brutality. He caused this appearance, unlawful custody, dumping of military bodies, and inhuman torture of the Baloch political activists are part of the state's first the Baloch nation was punished. Compared to all previous active hostilities in Pakistan, the ongoing conflict has brought much devastation to the Baloch, with the highest casualties, disappearances, and population displacement. Since 2005, reports in Kiril by certain Pakistani government officials, the Baloch Nationalist Party, the Baloch Human Rights Bureau, and International Human Rights Organization. Dumping of insulated bodies of missing persons has been made illegal again. Security is illegally there to support the parties to get in the foreign way. They are carrying out the induction of political abuse. They keep them in the legal detention to collect their human rights and then dump their insulated bodies to those in the legal area. They are doing this in collaboration with their local agents. These agents are primarily. Anti-social and uh, extremist religious elements organized by state security agents in various parts of the system and used in identifying, kidnapping, and dumping bodies of the people. They are popularly known as the army system. Various human rights organizations, including the human rights organization, there has been an answer that the number of missing persons and insulated bodies in recent months. According to the data collected by the Baluch Human Rights Council, the Kenyan Dump Policy has brought brutality in the province to an unprecedented level. From January to June 2002, 201 persons became the victim of enforced security. In addition, security forces extended the city of the city of Nani, and their brutality bodies were destroyed in various districts of Palestine. Since 2000, several new governments have been established in Balochistan, making the number of appropriate sex practically converted in Balochistan to a After every 25 kilometers, each point has been established, made either by regular army units or personal reports. But Pakistan has waited its power in Balochistan without consciousness. 
international role of Balochistan has been ruthlessly exploited by Pakistan since the beginning of its occupation. In recent decades, China has emerged as the main exploiter of the Baloch natural resources. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, is the face of this colonial practice. Cultural domination is another aspect of the human rights violations in the region. Balochi language is not being taught in schools. Instead, North Indian language has been declared as the official language of the state and medium of instruction in educational institutions. The thousand years old Balochi language is at the verge of extinction. In the school curriculum in Pakistan, Balanced health, cultural, and society norms are being ridiculed as un Islamic and the Balaj are defined as barbaric. Balaj entry into the corridors of power has been systematically blocked. Any political activity demanding the rights of the Balaj people is being regarded as anti state and anti Islamic. The genuine Balaj leadership has never been allowed to represent their people in the power circles of the state. As a facade, some of the social outcasts, drug traffickers, and religious fanatics, which are loyal to the army, and members of the death squad are being selected as the representatives of the Balach people. Anti-social and extremist religious elements organised by the state security agencies in various parts of Balochistan are being used in kidnapping and dumping of bodies of political and activists. They are popularly known in Balochistan as the army death squads. They act in conjunction with the security forces. In most of the documented cases, the perpetrators acted openly in broad daylight sometimes in busy public areas with apparently little concern for the presence of numerous witnesses. Political <laughs> activists, writers, singers, poets, and human rights defenders became victims of the army's proxy death wars since the start of the present century. On many occasions, the mutilated dead bodies of those killed have been found dumped in desolate areas Balochistan. The security agencies pick up human rights activists, journalists, doctors, teachers, political leaders, student activists, and tribal elders, and keep them in communicado for years. These people are dubbed the missing persons. The fate of hundreds of such people is still uncertain. In September 2010, Defense of Human Rights, an Islamabad-based human rights group, has put the number of missing persons at 1,700. Defense Human Rights groups have registered verified cases of the missing and disappeared persons. Sadar Akhtar Mengal, leader of the Balochistan National Party, submitted a list of missing persons to the National Assembly in Pakistan. The number increased from 82 in 2011 to 1,257 in 2015. The total number of missing people during this period is 3,732. During the last two years alone, 1,200 individuals have been added to the list of missing persons in Balochistan. Because of the atrocities, thousands have fled their abodes and are now living as refugees in various parts of Pakistan. Thousands have fled and are seeking asylum in different parts of the world. In order to clean the areas adjacent to China, Pakistan economic corridor projects rose, nearly a million people have been internally displaced. In the process of implementing this strategy, thousands were forced to leave their homes. Most affected are Kalu, Derabuti, Auran, Panashgur, and Ketch districts, where several settlements and villages are now ghost areas. Dumping of the 
Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Bazina Waman from SOAS, which is an institution I'm sure needs very little introduction. And so over to you, Dr. Bazina. Seabird, Glamajit, Balajistan, Pakistan at 75. When I lectured at the Paris of Westminster in 2017, Thanks then too to the Green Party's invitation on Pakistan at 70, I noted, quote, writing in 1943 after a four hour meeting with Mohammed Ali Jinnah at his Delhi home, American diplomat and President Roosevelt's special representative, William Phillips, noted, quote, 
The more I studied Mr. Jinnah's Pakistan, the less it appealed to me as the answer to India's communal problem. Since to break India into two separate nations would weaken both and might open Pakistan, at least, to the designs of ambitious neighbors. Close quote. I think Sri Lankans five years on would agree about, quote, ambitious neighbors, as we reflect on Pakistan generally and Pakistan particularly at 75. Dr. Dashi has undertaken the onerous task of yet again focusing our attention on the handling conditions and continuing human rights violations in Pakistan's largest, least populated, and least developed mineral rich province. I am forced to discuss matters that are of immediate concern to our host, the Green Party, and so my lecture will deal with Pakistan's environmentally unsustainable, financially unfeasible, and politically uncertain growth and development. I think seven years on since CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, was formally declared in April 2015, the much vaunted $62 billion package totaling 17% of Pakistan's GDP is not quite the game changer so many so naively cheered on. 51 agreements and MOUs were signed, initially worth $46 billion. CPEC's four components, broadly speaking, are Gwada Port in Baluchistan, infrastructure development, energy projects, and industrial zones. Chinese face and pride, those indelible oriental features have led to designate CPEC as the flagship of its Belt and Road investment. China's Marshall Plan, beautifully worth $1 trillion, which involves 140 countries, including Switzerland, and is approximately seven times more than what the US spent in post war Europe's recovery. What does the BRI seek to achieve besides projecting Chinese soft power and goodwill that was purported at the UN's Economic and Social Council? April 2017 workshop, Sustainable Developmental Goals, SDG, in consonance with the UN's 2030 goals, which of course will be of consequence to the Green Party, Lady Bennett, and so we are told, fulfill the five categories of SDGs, people, planet, prosperity, partnership and peace. All of these, much to the chagrin of Pakistani officialdom, are questionable. Peace? In search Iraq, Balochistan since 2005, and where a royally rigged election was convened in 2008, in which 65% of votes cast were bogus, has not had a day's peace as the deep state continues its pick up and dump routine, leading to forced disappearances and subsequent discovery by distraught relatives of mutilated cadavers weeks or even months on. I have reversed this, reversed this extensively both here in London and the UN Human Rights Council sessions in Geneva for several years. Partnership and prosperity? Well, the latter proceeds from the former, and Balochistan is not the only disaffected, disgruntled province in Pakistan, which has raised legitimate, compelling objections to the CPEC. Basic data on the CPEC program is controlled, scarce, and incomplete. Each project comes under the purview of a responsible agency, supervising agency, and executing agency. Scalable details are available on due diligence, feasibility, design, and construction details. There are key deficits as regards information, transparency, and credibility. For example, between 2011 and 2016, Beijing pledged $66 billion financial assistance, of which only 6% has materialized actually. Will the CPEC's poverty alleviating goals not actually worse in the situation, given how rife graft and corruption is throughout the Pakistani administration. Bailout. Pakistan has been bailed out 12 times since 1988. As for the provinces. What about peripheral ones such as the NWFP and Balochistan, who have justifiably pointed out whether the Punjab will not be disproportionately benefited? If CPEC is supposed to harmonize development in a fractured, physical society, then we must inquire how Balochistan, an underpopulated province with a yawning dearth of literate, skilled, gender balanced labor and low income levels will benefit since internal migration will predictably disrupt the condition of the local labor force and breed resentment and alienation. 
And what about Pakistan's strategic warm water natural harbor port, Gwada? Land has been expropriated from local barges who have not seen a penny due in compensation. Local fishermen need permission to fish in the Arabian Sea, now the monopoly of Pakistani and Chinese trawlers. As one Baluchi woman stated on social media, quote, we never fish between May to August as it is time for the fish to reproduce, but occupiers give no value to our ecosystem. They are using violence in all seasons to catch every living thing in the water, which is destroying the habitat, close quote. Environmental degradation is not to be ruled out as the Chinese, in cahoots with the Pakistanis, are planning to use Gwada not just for commercial but possible, possibly future military uses. There is talk also of a submarine base at Stonemiani Bay as China seeks to securitize its energy supplies passing through the Straits of Hormuz towards strategically located Balochistan. And what is the CPEC, ladies and gentlemen, if not to guarantee China a consistent flow of oil and gas and overcome its Malacca dilemma? 60% of its international trade and 85% of its hydrocarbon imports from Iran in the Gulf to Shanghai per force pass through the pirate-infested, narrow Straits of Malacca choke point in Southeast Asia, a 16,000-kilometer journey lasting two to three months, and Gwada reduces that by 5,000 kilometers. Gwada has been leased for 40 years to the Chinese, and as Mir Hassel Basenjo, a recently deceased Pakistani State Minister for Maritime Affairs, pointed out, revenues earned from Gwada only to the tune of 9% will accrue to Balochistan, with 91% growing to Beijing. It remains underutilized as a port since 2007, a white elephant like Sri Lanka's Amban Tota. CPEC also involves dumping on Pakistan's unsustainable polluting industries. That is embedded in its long-term objective of developing restive Western China's Xinjiang province and dumping its surplus output on external markets such as Pakistan, secure shipping lanes to consolidate its burgeoning hydrocarbon requirements, as I just pointed out, and obtain, in the final analysis, strategic assets from states with vulnerable economies, such as Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Laos, to be leveraged for Chinese power projection and potential military use in the future. Djibouti is a Chinese naval Indian Ocean base already, and Gwada could be mobilized in the future against India, which is already counting body bags of troops in a low-intensity Sino-Indian border clash ongoing since 2017 on its eastern front. As for energy projects within the CPEC portfolio, a study by the U.S. Institute of Peace declared that in the period 2015 to 2020, Pakistan's reliance on coal in, will increase from something like 1% to 24%, LNG liquefied natural gas from 4% to 13%, but solar and wind energy from 1% to 6%, and dependence on hydroelectricity will fall from 31% to 26%. Take, for instance, Port Carson Power Project in neighboring Sindh, located 37 kilometers east of Pakistan's financial nerve center, Karachi. This thermal power station burns coal imported from Indonesia and far-flung South Africa and Australia have also been recognized as alternative suppliers. Transport and foreign exchange reserves expenses aside, it was found that coal available in the Thar Desert in that very province, Sindh, was unsuitable for it is of inferior quality containing excessive amounts of lime and sulfur. Moreover, mixing locally sourced coal with imported stock could have damaged the boilers, raising safety issues. Massive deposits of lignite brown coal have also been found in Sindh. Extraction continues across Sindh, now a CPEC energy project, ever since coal was discovered in 1991 by the USAID, Agency for International Development. It is the 16th largest coal deposit in the world, and drilling has led to the discovery of potential deposits worth 175 billion tons of coal, which is equivalent to the combined total oil reserves of Saudi Arabia and Iran, thus leading Pakistan to source its energy requirements locally for at least 300 years. Further, as regards infrastructural projects, such as arterial highways and railways, there has been no comprehensive discussion of building a new or upgrading existing infrastructure. Will new investment overlook existing transport networks and, in so doing, not trigger environmental degradation by a waste of physical and financial resources?
ambiguity persists where the Pakistan has negotiated trade agreement agreements which would maximize returns for local markets. All CPEC projects are negotiated on an intergovernmental basis with Chinese firms selected by, naturally, China, and financing delay details, including terms and conditions that are publicly not disclosed. No figures have been made available by the Pakistan military as well, which has raised a 13,000 contingent of army battalions and civil armed force wings to secure the entire CPEC corridor, where Pakistan begins and ends. Balochistan to Gilgit-Baltistan, both rest of regions in slow burn secessionist mode, whose denizens, 75 years on, retain a complicated sense of being and belonging. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very informative talk. And I think there's an interesting demonstration in there about how models of development are issued by, both by China, Pakistan, and the United States um, uh, are a huge problem environmentally, socially, and in terms of human rights. And um, you know, I can't help, of course, thinking with my green hat on about how different it would be if the focus was on solar development which could, of course, be power that was decentralised, controlled by local people, schooled by local people, and what a different kind of development model that could be behind that. And I think that also, what we're talking about the fishing um, and how small-scale local artisan fishing can be a really important resource, whereas industrial hoovering up type fishing is a huge problem for so many parts of the world. So I know we're going to have a Q&A at the end. So anyone who's sitting there with questions they'd like to ask, do keep them in mind. Um, I do want to make sure we have time for that. But in the meantime, I'm going to move on to our next speaker, who's Dr. Lakumal Luhana, the General Secretary of the World Seed Congress. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks to Baroness Bennett, Peter Thatchell, and BHRC to organize this. There are only 14 minutes left, so I will be really very, very brief. In March 1948, when Pakistan occupied Balochistan, that has been 75 years. And in these 75 years, there are two things that have remained constant. One thing that the killing that the Pakistani state started that has never stopped. And then the fight of Baloch people for their survival and independence and freedom and human rights has also never stopped. In these 75 years, Tens of thousands have been ruthlessly murdered. And these tens of thousands are one of the finest sons and daughters of Balochistan. The intellectuals, the teachers, the poets, the political activists, the political workers, they are dividing the society of the intellectual capital, cap capital that make the society to move. And those tens of thousands that are who are missing, we don't know their fate. So those these are the people who, I mean, their lives have been snatched. But those who are condemned to live, I tell you very small an incident that one of the Sindhi political activists, young, he was he was extrajudicially killed, and people went to offer their condolences. And his father said he's, he, he was fortunate that he, he was killed because he don't now have to go through the pain and suffering and slavery and humiliation. I'm unfortunate because I have to die every day. I have to, I have to go through that pain. I live in slavery and I, I, I go through that humiliation. And that is the life of all those beloved people who are condemned to live. Just imagine, you won't believe the statistics. In Balochistan, 
I mean, we say this is the official figures. We we say it is much more than seventy percent of the children between the age of five to sixteen they have never seen it. And for the girl education, they are more than eighty percent. They literally live in medieval times. See, Balochistan makes the forty-two percent of the area mass of Pakistan, and only about twelve million people. And as Dr. Nasir said, one million people are displaced. It means one in twelve Baloch people they have to they were forced they were coerced to leave their motherland, and that is the situation. There are no roads, no 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 hospitals, no nothing. And what is our fault? What is our crime? Yes, we Baloch and Sindhis have done a crime. And that, that is why we are being punished. And our crime is that 80% of wealth of Pakistan comes from nowhere but Balochistan and Sin. Because the entire strategic, geostrategic importance of Pakistan entire that comes from Balochistan and Sin. That is the question is that literally. This is one of the most ruthless army in the world that has committed not one, numerous genocide, genocide in, in Bangladesh, genocide in Balochistan, genocide in Sindh, genocide in, in, in Pashtunka. They don't have care of any, any care of, of life. And we, the people in these circumstances are standing against that. And in that situation, the saddest thing is that say what we talk about it, the human rights they are universal and every human because the human existence the 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 entire humanity they came to this conclusion that human existence is conditioned by the human rights if they don't have human rights they don't have they don't have human existence and literally every human right every 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 uh, freedom and the human right that is Guaranteed in the United Nations Charter of Human Rights, is literally denied everyone. So, what life do we even have there? The question is about the international community in these circumstances where the odds we don't compare with these days. Because our saddest thing is that all the resources that we have, that are ours, that should be used for our people, Pakistan take these, grasp these, loot these, and use them. To strengthen their, their killing machinery, killing us. And the international community, the, 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 the countries, they support Pakistan. Why they support Pakistan? Why they put this blind eye towards the human rights violations? Because of the Pakistan's strategic, geostrategic interest. And that doesn't come from anywhere, that comes from us. That is our geostrategic interest. So it is really very important. Pakistan is a country which is really. They, these, these countries know better, more, much more than us. There is no other institution. It's only military. There's no parliament, no judiciary, no nothing. They run it. And now it is becoming more and more and more exposed. And it is they really are, the international community are playing with the fire. It is the country which has got the sixth largest nuclear arsenal in the world. It has got one of the See, uh, one of, it has got the largest per capita soldiers in the world. And the country, because they survive on international the aid because of the conflicts, they survive on two things, our loot and the international money. And the international money comes when there is a conflict. They were supported from very beginning, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, because there were conflicts. These conflicts now, they are changing situation. And therefore, that, that money isn't coming that extent. And therefore, our loot and our operation, uh, our subjugation and our suppression is becoming really, really ruthless. Now it is time for us whether to be or not to be. It is time for the international community to decide. And they should understand. Because there aren't many people like Natalie and Peter in the world. These countries, they think about their national interest and even their national interest, because how many times we get this opportunity to go and lobby and tell us our miseries? We will have this. How many policymakers will listen to this? But they need to understand. They 
by once they conquer us they kill us they eliminate the that is what they want to do world will be a much much unstable and dangerous place they need to understand this and we need to carry this message and this is our sos call to them they are killing us they are eliminating us and it is your duty as a human being to stand by us and to support us to fight, to fight against this to, for the survival of our people and for our motherland for our dignity and for our freedom thank you Thank you very much for that powerful call. And one of the, the phrases that I wrote down was the plane is fire. Um, we know we have we the international community, broadly speaking, um, know that supporting repressive human rights of these regimes eventually ends in disaster. Uh, Saddam Hussein was the rest's friend and ally until he wasn't. Colonel Gaddafi in Libya was supported of the West friends and ally until it wasn't. And I could keep going with that list and raising nuclear weapons. I mean, I work with many people and the majority of the world's countries back a global ban on nuclear weapons. And the world will never be secure until we have a global ban on nuclear weapons. So I could keep going, but I'm going to restrain myself from the chair and hand over next the Peter Tatchell from the Peter Tatchell Foundation. Over to you, Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank you, Natalie, for hosting this meeting and also Dr. Dashti for organising it. Um, please give them a big applause. I pay tribute to the previous speakers who have outlined the problem in great detail and with great urgent necessity. What I'd like to do is focus on how we get from where we are to where we want Lodgestan to be. So I want to look at some practical things about how you build a movement and what that movement needs to do to be successful. Now the ideas I'm discussing tonight have been ideas that have been worked out by Boloch activists with me over several years. These are ideas that we believe are, if you like, a roadmap for peace and self-determination in Balochistan. We're not saying they're the be all and end all, but they set out a series of ideas about how the Balochistan movement gets international recognition and successfully puts pressure on the international community. So we came up with the idea of six stages for peace and self-determination, a roadmap modeled very loosely on the Vietnam peace proposals when Vietnam and the United States were at war. They came up with a, a roadmap to de-escalate and to conclude a peace agreement. So these ideas are drawn from that kind of model. So the first, I think, demand that's necessary is for a UN supervised ceasefire. The cessation of military operations by all sides and the confinement of Pakistani forces to barracks and Baluch nationalist insurgents to guerrilla camps. That's the first fundamental demand that needs to be made. The second is, of course, the release of all political prisoners and a full account of all disappeared persons. The third is to have open access to all parts of Balochistan for media, aid agencies, and human rights organizations. The fourth proposal is the right of return of displaced refugees, the restoration of their property, and compensation by Pakistan for losses caused in the conflict. Fifth is an end to the inward colonization of Balochistan by non baloch settlers. And sixth, a UN supervised referendum on self-determination, offering the people of Balochistan the choice of remaining within Pakistan in some form or going for full independence. Now, those kind of six proposals, I think, are a roadmap, a set of proposals 
that can be put to the international community and to Pakistan to move forward in a concrete, practical way. Um, the other big issue that we face is that it is very unclear to the international community what the Balochistan national forces want. And that is why, together with Baloch activists some years ago, we drafted a proposed Balochistan Freedom Charter, which also has six points. And they were, first, social justice, equality, and human rights for all Baloch people, including, very importantly, gender rights for women. And I have to rebuke you. Uh, there are only three women in this room. No liberation movement will ever win and has ever won in history without the support of women. You're fighting half your strength. So that's an issue that really does need to be addressed within the movement. Uh, the second is land reform. The right of every adult person to have a share in land ownership. Third, the general redistribution of wealth and power to all the people of Balochistan. There are incredible social inequalities within Balochistan society at the moment. Fourth, a secular state where people of all faiths and none have equal legal status and where no religion is privileged in law, government, or public institutions. Fifth, democratic and personal freedoms, including free multi-party elections, the right to protest, the right to strike, freedom of speech in the press, as enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and in the United Nations International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And sixth, a UN Commission of Inquiry into Disappeared Persons, the Victims of Detention Without Trial, Torture and Extrajudicial Killings, leading to a UN Special Tribunal to Prosecute Human Rights Abusers for War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity. This Freedom Charter was devised very loosely, but inspired by the Freedom Charter of the African National Congress in South Africa. Again, a clear, practical set of ideas and principles that South African people mobilize around to end apartheid. So what I'm really saying is, to get where you want to be, you have to have a plan. You have to have a roadmap. You have to set out what are the key demands to ensure a negotiated settlement. Now, of course, Pakistan is not likely to negotiate in the foreseeable future. But the international community wants to know what are your terms and conditions for negotiations? So, as I said, you know, the cessation of all hostilities, the ceasefire, um, the release of all political prisoners and so on. You need to have those practical concrete proposals to satisfy the international community that you have a plan. And then secondly, the international community wants to know, what will you do if you have power? Are you going to turn Balochistan to another Islamist state and wage terror around the world? No, of course you're not. But you need to spell that out to reassure the international community that an independent Balochistan will be democratic with equality and human rights for all. Now, just finally, I want to suggest some interim proposals that the movement could be focusing on. Um, and the first is to pressure for a halt of all Western arms sales to Pakistan. As you will know, many of the arms sales to Pakistan are currently being diverted. They are intended to fight Al-Qaeda ISIS and other terrorist groups. But they're actually being diverted to suppress the people of Balochistan. And those weapons include, for example, US supplied F-16 fighter jets and Cobra attack helicopters that have been used to bomb Baloch villages, destroy crops, killing civilians and livestock. Now, it happens to be that 
under the Leahy Agreement and the Foreign Assistance Act in the United States, it is forbidden <laughs> for Washington to provide weapons to foreign armed forces that contravene human rights. So the question is, why are US arms still being funneled to Pakistan despite the demonstrable human rights abuses and war crimes in occupied Balochistan? I would say that you need allies in the United States to try and enforce the Foreign Assistance Act and the Leahy Amendment um, to ensure that those arms sales are curtailed. Second point is that the United Nations should appoint a special rapporteur on Balochistan, like it does in many conflict areas, uh, to investigate, monitor and report to the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council on human rights abuses and ethnic and cultural discrimination. Third and related, a UN fact-finding mission to urgently assess independently the deteriorating human rights situation in Balochistan. Fourth, Pakistan should be pressed to lift entry restrictions and permit free entry to Balochistan to aid agencies, journalists, and human rights defenders in order to ensure the delivery of aid to the impoverished population, to enable free media reporting about human rights abuses, and to allow the documentation of the effects of military occupation. Fifth, the military and intelligence chiefs in Pakistan should be prosecuted on charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity under international humanitarian law, including potentially via the International Criminal Court or via a UN special tribunal, as was set up in the past in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda in response to the human rights abuses there. In particular, prosecution should be initiated against the former <coughs> military dictator, Fervez <coughs> Musharraf, and the ex-head of the 12th Corps, Lieutenant General Nasser Junja. In the interim, international arrest warrants should be issued for all those Pakistan military and political leaders who have been involved with or colluded with war crimes and crimes against humanity in Balochistan. And then sixth, the bringing of civil claims in the US courts by Baloch victims of human rights violations by Pakistani state officials using the Alien Tort Claims Act. This is a legislation in the United States that has a universal jurisdiction and many human rights abusers have been uh, had civil actions brought against them using that legislation. Uh, seventh, to make all civilian aid to Pakistan conditional on ending human rights violations. Um, until Islamabad complies, all aid should be withdrawn from the Pakistani government and, where necessary, switch to local and international aid agencies that conform to international human rights norms. Obviously, we do not want poor people in Pakistan to suffer, but the aid should not go via the government while it abuses human rights. It should go via other agencies. Um, eighth, a boycott, disinvestment, and sanctions campaign targeting Pakistani government, military, business, and intelligence officials who are implicated in human rights abuses in Balochistan. And sixth and related, the implementation of Magnitsky sanctions. The United States and Britain both have passed Magnitsky Acts to bring human rights abusers to justice. Key Pakistani military and officials uh, and political leaders should be put on that sanctions list. They should be forbidden to travel. They should have their bank accounts seized and other assets and so on. Those laws already exist in about 11 countries right now, including Britain and the United States. My question is, why aren't they being enforced? And we should be lobbying our politicians here in Britain to get magnitude sanctions against the key Pakistani human rights abusers. 
So those are just a few ideas for consideration. I'm not saying they're the be all and end all. I'm not saying you should you know, uncritically adopt them. But these are ideas to think about because there are a way in which we can progress this movement and get to the seat of power to influence people who want to know what is your plan for peace, independence and reconciliation? What is the kind of society you're going to create? And what can we do right now in terms of bringing action against Pakistan? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for that typically clear and comprehensive and ever so slightly daunting and a bit of a gas moment uh, list. Um, I think the schedule says that I'm now supposed to talk for 10 minutes, which I'm not going to do. Um, I'm just going to offer a couple of thoughts and suggestions of what the limited support that I might be able to offer. And I think I was very pleased, Peter, that you got to the Majinsky style sanctions because that is a new, I think we've seen really very powerful toolkit, which is an interesting case study for a broader point, which is that is something that came about entirely through civil society campaigning. I mean, I actually, as the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Hong Kong, chaired a meeting where Bill Browder, who was the American who was the driving force behind those sanctions, spoke about how it was a treatment of one of his own employees in Russia that led him to start the campaign to say, how do we actually target individuals who can be held responsible for human rights abuses? And I think it's now a very powerful tool. And what's interesting about it is that it started out, it wasn't a government decision. It was one person who got together with other people who worked together and campaigned. And one of my messages that I bring to every audience, including nine-year-old school children, is that we need a world where everyone makes politics what they do, not have done to them. And the powerful force of many, many people being involved. Sometimes people think we've got to work through the government. And of course, governments are a crucial tool and they're the ones approving arms sales, etc. But Majinsky sanctions started out with a small group of people campaigning that have now become a global campaign and increasingly global action. And so I think what I'd add to what, what Peter just said is also look for um, uh, NGO campaigning allies. And one of the organisations I was thinking it might be well worth your while approaching is the UN Association, which is groups of people and they're indeed local groups. So if you're around the country, you can approach your local UN Association group and talk to them about these issues and get people engaged in the issue at that grassroots kind of level. And that's a way in which you can really build a movement, build understanding, which is crucial to eventually seeing government action. Because governments, whether it's their environmental issues, as we were talking about before, or on human rights and political issues, it's very seldom that governments have a moment of, right, it's time we did the right thing. They have to be pushed by social pressure, by campaigning, by people working together to make them do the right thing. And you know, I hope today and the lists that Peter has just given and the discussion we've had you know, is the foundation of that. So I do want to, on that dialogue, better than monologue, making politics what you do, now very much want to open the floor and encourage people to ask questions. We're obviously not going to re-arrive any resolution of Peter's plans there, but you know, perhaps if there's something that particularly struck you and you've got a thought or a question, or if you've got questions to any of our other speakers, um, I will ask to try and get some people in to not be too long, but we'll try and get as many people as we can. And I see, I've got a, I can see two hands, right, I can see three hands, so I'm going to go one, two, three, we'll take that, and then we'll come to the next round. We'll take those three contributions and then come back. Thank you. And being someone in the parliament, what I'm getting to who this question is how the government can play a good role. 
regard to the Baluchi people. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, three questions and then and then come back. Yep. Thanks, uh, I will continue. Thanks for the question. My question is: We have a series of actions that can do without doing much, like uh, the existing legislation, or action. Uh, how we can do this? I'm a victim of 1971 Bangladesh liberation, where my elder brother was a 17 year old freedom fighter, was captured, tortured for 10 days, and was killed by a Muslim Pakistani, another Muslim Bengali on the eighth day, 21st of November, 1970. I've been carrying this grievances for the last 15 years. I was only 11 years old. Now, I'm very thankful that you have organized this fantastic, very appropriate uh, meeting for us to discuss. And also Peter's suggestions are really, really very prudent, well thought. But going back 15 years, the trinity of the devils in Pakistan, China, and America, they have done the same damage to Bangladesh, killed in excess of 3 million people, raped 400 to 800,000 women. They've stolen every single valuable item that Bengal had. They've taken it away. Now, for some ironic reason, the world seemed to have turned a blind eye. The plight of the Bengali people has never been recognized. That has given Pakistan this free hand to exercise whatever they want to do, wherever they want to do. They have done it in Kashmir, they're doing it in Sindh. There is no Sindhi people in Sindh. They're doing it in Balochistan, and they have initiated, started in East Pakistan. So I would urge the UK government as the epitome of democracy, please put some pressure and stop this genocide. They are perpetuating everywhere, and I don't know what is next. So it is a pledge that I would like to make to this house, and I express my solidarity with the people of Balochistan. Let us do something so that we can bring this to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much. This question directed at me. Um, I have notes you might have seen in front of me, and I'm already thinking of half a dozen written questions that I can put down to the government um, about arms sales, some of the points Peter's raised, um, about Majinsky style sanctions. I, I know what answer I'll get, which is they don't talk about it, but I can still say, have you considered Majinsky style sanctions against person X, Y, and Z? Um, so, I used to say that I can put that I can put down twelve written questions a week. I used to say the government has to answer them. I now say the government has to provide some text in response, which is not quite the same thing. But nonetheless, if the answer is inadequate, I can then come back with a follow-up question. So my starting point will be to ask the question that the government has to put some statements about Baluchistan on the record, and that's where I'll start. <laughs> And just to pick up your point, Ivan, I mean, I would frame this all in a very much even longer political context. Um, if anyone hasn't picked up, my accent comes from Australia originally. And I grew up on the lands that were stolen from an Aboriginal people in Sydney by white settler colonial. I'm a descendant of that white settler colonial. 
Uh, if you go back um, when the East India Company arrived on the Indian subcontinent, the Indian subcontinent produced about 25% of the world's GDP. And if you go down the road here, you can go, if you happen to go into the Foreign Office, uh, the first time I went in there, I looked at all of the marble and all of the gold and, you know, all of the very fancy architecture. Indeed, you could look around here with much the same thing and thought that's where the wealth of the Indian subcontinent went. Um, and that change from 25% of global GDP to a tiny fraction was because it was robbed. And that's a pattern that has continued for a very long time. But that's not a council of despair because these issues now are being talked about in ways that have never been talked about, certainly except at the very fringes before. You look at the Black Lives Matter movement that has had huge impact in the, in the US and the UK. There is now an attempt to start to address some of the issues of history. Um, I was just reading a, a German university is looking to try and change its name because its founder was an anti-Semite. There is a real engagement happening now. So you're starting at a very good time for the frame to, to look at that. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Peter for the how do you... How do you, how do you I think uh, there are several things that you, the movement could feasibly do in the here and now. One is, of course, to press for Magnitsky-style sanctions on key Pakistan military and political leaders. That's one. Um, a halt to arms sales or restrictions on arms sales or the types of arms being sent. Um, Britain's arms sales to Pakistan are quite considerably less than they used to be, but there's still some. Um, the issuing of international arrest warrants um, and making aid conditional on human rights observance. That is supposed to be the British policy, but quite clearly is not the case. And then there is the question of boycott. Um, I'm trying, you'll probably help me. What is Pakistan's main export to Britain? If you can identify that. <laughs> well, if, if there's any tangible product that, 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 that Pakistan exports, then a boycott of those. Um, but for things like Manitsky sanctions, international arrest warrants, what is really crucial is to provide evidence. So we can't simply say these people are abusing human rights. We have to have names, dates, places, consequences. So really, ideally, what you need are legal affidavits by victims of Pakistan's human rights abuses. And these could be many years ago, or more recently, doesn't matter, but provided they're in, a, in, a, in the form of a legal affidavit or a, a statement with you know, witnesses signed, um, that is what you need to get any movement on Magnitsky sanctions or on international response. Governments will only act when they have verified testimony corroborated by victims and others about these abuses. So I would say that's, that's something that really the movement needs to aim for very urgently to get those statements. Now, I know there are some statements out there, and some statements I think have been put through the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. Um, um, but I think you need to focus more on getting those and collating them in a form that would be acceptable in a court of law. So it's basically legal affidavits, you know, signed by the victim with witnesses and, you know, signed by a legal a solicitor or other uh, legal person. All right, I think we've got another, at least one more round of questions. I think perhaps one of the women, I, yes, because um, I do actually just want to say that I would very much echo what Peter said about the need to make sure women are involved. So without putting that pressure on you, your question first, thank you.
directly because it was directed to me before we go to future questions and I'm a feminist this is my first politics and um, I actually spent two years volunteering with the Thailand National Commission on Women's Affairs and indeed my first um, one of the theses as I wrote at university was on the female prime ministers of South Asia um, and trying as a woman to tackle these issues for other women because I had power and advantage is something that's that's close to my heart that is essentially the foundation of my politics. It, I was in these very walls working on a domestic abuse bill in the UK that was improved but is still not good enough and women are abused and victims in the UK in the same way. This is a global issue um, and I guess I didn't make this explicit, but when I started speaking about human rights being universal, it shouldn't need to be said that that means for women too, but it does need to be said. And just one practical point that you might want to think about campaigning on, in fact, two practical points that occur to me, one of which is uh, several prime ministers back now, I think we're going three prime ministers back in the UK to David Cameron. Um, there was a lot of work done by the British government at least publicly, on um, tackling rape as a weapon of war and highlighting that utter unacceptability and the fact that it was happening and trying to ensure that there was some kind of um, response to that. And I happen to know about quite a bit about the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is another place where rape as a weapon of war has been a huge issue and women have been targeted. So I think there has been a change in rhetoric on this and you, know, you might like to, I think um, in, the, in the House of Commons, Ian Duncan Smith, a Tory MP, is one of the people who was very prominent in that at the time and that's someone you might like to reach out to and look at people who were involved in that and say, hey, look at what's happening in Baluchistan as well. Um, I'm, you know, I don't have magic answers, but it's something I will always prioritise as an issue. And just as you were speaking, something else that occurred to me practically that you could do is, um, I know that, well, you may not know, but there is the slightly weird situation that the there are 16 or 18 bishops who are members of the House of Lords and the Church of England has a special place in the UK Constitution. 
we'll, we'll, we'll park any comment on that, but that's the way it is. And I know the church has been very interested in the issue of the rights, particularly of Christians in Pakistan and the use of the blasphemy laws. And if you haven't already reached out to the Church of England, that would be a potentially powerful force. And there are a lot of people, uh, Christians, Muslim and others, who do do work on religious freedom. And that's something that might be a useful contact for you to reach out. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm well aware that's not an adequate answer, but it's the best answer that I can give. And thank you for the question. All right, I'm going to let you just get one more thing. Yeah. How can the similar political systems. You know, wherever you live, your local MP has a responsibility to help you if you have an, an issue with local officialdom, i.e. the police not helping you. So, so my practical advice would be go to the police first. If you don't get an adequate response, then go to your local MP. And that's just a, a piece of practical advice. So I think you know, certainly somewhere like Canada would apply also. Um, and it's certainly something I'm aware of. Again, I know Hong Kong students in the context of China's abuse of human rights in Hong Kong have suffered at UK universities. And I know that the Uyghur um, people have also suffered enormously from that of Chinese state interference around the world. So it's not, you know, this is an issue. Again, there's no magic solution, but start with police and then go for the political route would be my recommendation. Okay, I'm gonna, all right, yes, beside you and then the gentleman over there and the gentleman there, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess my, my, my question is, there are daily human rights um, abuses happened in Balochistan, people are being you know, dehumanised all over the world, and this is, people are being targeted in a very clear, structured way, from language upwards to their resources, on a daily basis. What can we do to save the campaign for Balochistan? I'm going to take the next question, which was over there. Yep. Peter Parker, I met someone yesterday and he said, there some 18 years back, there was no one to help him, so Peter Parker came forward and helped that person. Right. <laughs> is it possible that uh, if uh, a community is formed and they visit villages and they will actually meet the people, uh, is it possible to uh, violate the community is being on villages? Okay, and there was a question over here. I did pick someone out here. So, my name is Shahzad Mahmoud, and my question is specifically with. Because to the poor, and basically, as you mentioned, this very should be conditional. When I was just reading through, Pakistan was one of the top three recipients of foreign aid from the UK. After even uh, Ethiopia and Afghanistan, they are the second and third. And there are almost 305 million pounds 
and a CFK stats chairman as well. And being from British, uh, then Britain, is the question that taxpayer money is spending, but what are the priorities? One, and there is, I know there is already a committee in place. They're questioning and investigating the impact of this whole aid given to Pakistan. Uh, this is a question that this committee should look into the what portion has been spent on Balochistan? What was the priority? What were the priorities? As uh, Nakusa mentioned, that you know, almost our more than seventy percent children are out of school in primary, and hardly our children. There is high infant mortality ratio in Asia. That is Balochistan. Where the DFID money is going. And lastly, if there is a committee, they should look into it that uh, in terms of the NGOs, because I am one of the kind of, I will not say victim, but like I was national head for action at UK in Pakistan. But this UK based organization, we were, uh, you know, closed and shipped by government of Pakistan. Despite our efforts, despite our transparencies, uh, we were told to leave the country. And you know how it affects when, when the UK based NGO is working since 13, 40 years. And we had all over the work in Pakistan. And the difference was because action had spoke about rights, environment, governance, and economy. The case was. So my question would be would you, is it possible if you would recommend a committee that they should, uh, you know, Again, look into the details how much was spent in Baluchistan, sorry if I'm repeating. And then again, if there is any additional aid, like I know there is 200 million more aid to Pakistan. If this should be conditions, conditioned based on the right conditions of Baluchistan. Because Baluchistan is 48% of Pakistan, and they show our pictures to get funds, to be honest. They show our quality to get funds, but when it comes to the distribution of funds, we never get the right amount of support from the federal government for the high NGOs. And high NGOs are not allowed to work in Pakistan. I, I, I was originally from Pakistan. So thank you so much. There are a lot of things, but I think uh, importantly, uh, I'm sure you're in one list as well uh, in terms of the Greens, because I'm a bit closely associated with Greens as well. One of the conditions, because in Gavadar, the investment should be I think you, Professor, mentioned very good details about the environmental issues of Gawadar, where the fisher community lost their livelihoods, one, and displacement of the communities. And secondly, environmental damage. And I always question, even my MPs there in Balochistan, that can you ask in your own parliament and the international investors that where is, I've never seen it, if you've seen it, Professor Saab, anyone will see, where is the environmental impact assessment of Gawadar? And see that in Balochistan. Where is that? Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'm aware that um, those questions were kind of directed at me slightly. So I'm going to very briefly respond to those, then try and allow time for one more round of questions from the audience. Then I'm going to ask each person who's spoken to perhaps just make one sum up, minute or two. I know that's very difficult, but just so that we, we have a kind of wrap up at the end, because we do want to sort of end at about 8.20 and I mean, we could keep going all evening, I have no doubt, but that's, you know, this is a starting point, not an end point, I think it is crucial. So just to, re to respond to those three questions personally, um, how can we safely campaign? Um, I mean, I think we've already addressed the issues that campaigning you know, can be risky, particularly from people from Bullock backgrounds and people can be targeted within the UK or anywhere. But I think in terms of protecting safety of people in Belushistan who might be relatives or whatever, um, I mean, simply the, you're talking about practical arrangements of making sure you don't identify people that you use pseudonyms, that you're careful if, if you're describing an incident that you don't identify the person who might have been the eyewitness you were reporting. I mean, I must admit, I was looking at some of the, the bit, some of that footage and worrying about whether it might have been possible for someone on site to identify who was holding the camera, um, where it's a clandestine camera. So, I mean, it's, it's not perfect. And I mean, again, as 
involved my involvement with Hong Kong, we did an inquiry into Chinese human rights abuses in Hong Kong. And we went to great lengths to try and make it all as secure online as it could be. But of course, we were talking about the Chinese state and we had to say to all of our witnesses, we're doing everything we can, but we cannot absolutely guarantee that you are safe because you know, technology being what it is, that's the reality. So I think you take all the precautions you can and that's and and make sure people are giving you as informed consent as possible to use their information. And I think that's all you can do. Um, the question about a forming parliamentary committee, um, the traditional way of raising an issue up the agenda, one of the things that you can do, if it's possible, is form what I've referred to the all-party parliamentary group on Hong Kong. Um, potentially, you could form an all-party parliamentary group on Baluchistan. Now, some one of the barriers to that I can immediately see is to be an all-party parliamentary group, you have to have someone from all of the major parties. So you would have to identify a Conservative, a Labour and a Lib Dem person um, to be involved in that. Um, there are also ways of forming groups like all party parliamentary groups that aren't all parliamentary groups, um, often described as cross-party groups. But the practical reality is support that and really make it work takes quite a bit of resources. Just practically speaking, to get the email lists of people, to invite them along, to organise the meetings. And you really need to have developed the whole campaign to a stage where you've got that level of resources. Um, so, you know, I would say to you that I'd be prepared to help at some stage, but be aware that to take that step takes quite a lot of resources. And it mightn't at this point be the best way to get resources. Just targeting me, you know, find it at someone in the other place, the House of Commons, who's sympathetic. Um, possibly you might find even a, a, an MP who's not particularly innately sympathetic, but if they have a large Baluk community in their constituency, they may well be interested, even just to put your questions in an arm's length kind of way, but representing their constituents is something they might be prepared to do. So that's another way of, of doing that. And the question about overseas development, or official overseas, uh, official development assistance. Um, I mean, we have a huge problem. Obviously, I'm sure many people know that it has been slashed. The overall level has been slashed. And the government has explicitly redirected its targeting away from poor people towards UK trade interests, which is obviously not the direction that you want to see it happening. It's utterly the wrong direction from your point of view. Um, that is a bit much broader fight that lots of lots of people um, and um, I mean there's a, there's a couple of Tory peers um, I'll mention a name she may not thank me but um, Liz Sugg Baroness Sugg S U W G um, she is was the government aid minister and she resigned from her post over the cut in aid. And she has a particular interest in women's issues, reproductive rights issues, girls' education, etc. So that's the kind of thing you can do is identify people who may have an interest that's part of your interest. And they may not pick up your whole issue, but you might find this side would be interested in asking questions about what sort of aid is going to girls' education, education in Pulitzerstan or something. So that, practically speaking, is the kind of thing that a little bit of research in Hansard, which is the record of Parliament, can actually take you in the direction of, you know, you don't have to get people 100% on side to start off with, just get them a little bit down the road and they will learn more. And that's, I'd suggest, the way forward. Okay, I'm looking at the time and thinking we might be able to get in three more questions and then I'm going to come to each member of the panel. Okay, I've got one hand there, one hand there, and one right at the back. Okay, uh, gentlemen there first. So I'm a bit uh, not sure about the UK and the European 
understand that we are all temporary. So how we must or where we can scatter our own activities across the world for just a handful? How do we probably manage our country to take up the issue and that? I'm going to come to the gentleman just behind you just because the camera is already pointed that way, so that saves a bit of effort. Gentleman behind you, yeah. Okay, thank you. And there was one more question on this side. Yeah. I would like to May I say my experience, my own experience. When I was in secondary school, and I'm from Dashtiari, Chabahar, the western part of Baluchistan, sitting around with my father and my mother and Havala, lunch together and make toil, uh, make a point because we didn't have at that time that I always advise out my voice. So I talk with myself, with my family. Why you don't uh, listen to Baluch people? I have talked with Jawan, but without some client. But today I'm here in England. I have a dream. My dream is that Balochistan can be in the field. Balochistan has the resources. That resources right now the Baluch people can Use it. Not only the Baruch people, the people around the world. We have, I am going to be a part of this solution. I don't want to ask the questions because I already asked all the questions to myself. But I want to say that international community, right now, they have to straight their hands to the Baruch people. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, what I'm going to do is go back to all of our speakers and we'll perhaps we'll go in the order that you spoke just because that makes life nice and easy logistically. And if I could just ask you any kind of wrap up or answer to questions, just a couple of minutes if you could, if we start with you. Thank you very much. I think that the wrong question was asking help from the international community. And I think that although they have not expressed it, but the, the Baloj people, they think that the Great Britain is some part of it in their miseries because they were occupied, they were divided, and then they, they created a, an artificial country of Pakistan. They forced Pakistan to buy Baloochistan because of the Cold War era conflict between the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. So uh, they want some kind of help from the international community, especially from the people of the UK, the UK group. That is the main thing in their all, all these questions. Okay, thank you very much. And Dr. Wagner. Uh, <clears throat> what the lady mentioned about uh, foreign pressure, that needs to be brought as Germany brought pressure on Khan and I after the Mykonos flood and the Kurdish killings and other Iran activists in Berlin. This can be done. Uh, Justin Trudeau lost uh, credibility when he did not uh, speak up about Karima Baruch's uh, killing. Nothing has come out of it. Then also the other bunch, a lecturer at Uppsala University of Sweden who died subsequently. Uh, Sweden and uh, Canada and others can talk about. Azerbaijan, of course, would not uh, because it's a shaky uh, quality, uh, you call it democracy. But uh, Canada and others are powerful enough to take Pakistan to task, but are reticent to do so. Canada suspended diplomatic relations with Iran. There is no Iran legacy in Ottawa today. Uh, under Stephen Harper's government, the Conservative government prior to him. And uh, Trudeau has continued that uh, to date. Uh, Canada spoke up about also the Ukraine aircraft uh, shooting that up from Tehran airport, remember, 
and Iranian stat who are Canadian citizens. Why did Canada not speak about uh, Karim Khan, which is absolutely deplorable? That needs to be uh, stated. And coming home to Britain, I do not see an APPG on Pakistan forming because, uh, quite frankly, given the Labour Party's Pakistani Muslim Punjabi lobby, and the Labour Party under Corbyn is completely in talk to them as a Muslim vote bank. They will do everything and anything. There are hardly any parties in the British Isles. They are normally Maypuris and Punjabis. They will call the shots. They will distort the discourse. And not just with the Labour Party particularly, but also with conservatives and the Lib Dems, who will add uh, some Pakistani constituency voters to them, that they will uh, do what they've always done, show this to be a security issue, and that uh, Pakistan is fighting against terror, ostensibly against the war against terror, and that uh, the Babajis are not the victims that they're purportedly making out to be. And this is what is being done, and what Zora Yusuf, who was Pakistan Human Rights Commission chairwoman said several years ago that the entire uh, kill and gun routine is being portrayed for public external consumption by Pakistan as a war on terror, uh, just to assuage donors in the West and uh, uh, Western powers that be. And Pakistani uh, patriots who are isolated identity immigrants in, London, in England, labor voting source, will be geared into action to completely drown out your voice. Make no mistake about that. Not a single Muslim MP in the Labour Party or Conservative will have the guts to speak about Pakistan because they have links back home, they have assets back home, families and friends, and they will not speak as Punjabis about Pakistan. Make no mistake about that. And sorry to sound cynical, but as a historian, I am a realist. A, a, a useful analysis without being in any way, my comments, party political. Although just one positive thought to add to that is um, what's happened with the Uyghurs in China has actually been, in terms of political arguments, a useful way of pointing out that the war on terror agenda can be used in ways that are blatantly um, inexcusable. And so that is one of the responses to that without being complete answer to that. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to stop the key to use my zip to pay the top of the bar. Thank you. 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 It is their paper that is triggered by people of Bangladesh. But without the support of the international community, the international organizations, and international <laughs> every person that any country gives to Pakistan, any piece of information, any technical information, any weapon, that establishes the perpetrators of the crimes against humanity. Therefore, anyone who supports them is supporting these crimes against the case syndicate. Probably, I was reading an article that the US, that is three, four years ago, they, they were given aid under the category bill to support the Developed these uh, 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 civil society and all of that. Pakistan used 300 million out of 102 million that were given each year for lobbying so that they would continue to receive. Therefore, we cannot compete. The message should go to the countries that stop support because this is now without any doubt that Pakistan is committing crimes against liberty. In and any, every penny that you give to them is the same as no one because in Pakistan there is no other institution. Everything is determined and decided by the army and army and army. Therefore, the only way, and not only really, because probably they feel in this country that their interest, international uh, strategic interests are aligned with the Pakistan, honestly, we can have long drawn discussion that that is not the case. The interest of the entire world 
is aligned and should be aligned, and this is the message, and this is the argument that we should forward, stand and align with people of the um, In terms of the pressure in the UK government, the two strongest or easiest avenues to tackle are sales, either to pick or stop them, or make them conditional um, and restrictive in terms of the time of reference where they use. And secondly, making civilian aid conditional on Pakistan's state. Those are the two things that most members of parliament are most likely to feel, to feel comfortable engaging with. It. But of course, they won't respond unless they have some kind of authoritative report to document the abuse. So you need a report from the Human Rights Commission, Dan, the Balak Human Rights Organization, Amnesty International, or Human Rights Watch. You need Authority of organizations to present the report, which can then be the basis of the response of Parliament and argue yes, we should, on this evidence, restrict arms sales. We should, on the basis of this evidence, uh, make a civilian aid conditional on human rights respect. The other thing uh, that's very important is that you can, of your own mission, write to your own member of parliament to ask him or her to write to the foreign secretary to ask how much aid has Pakistan received in the UK, let's say in the last three years, where has this money been spent and on what project? You need to get that, again, that evidence to arm yourself to be effective campaign. So that's something everybody in this room can do, write to them to ask him or her to write to the foreign secretary to establish where the aid is going for the time they did it. Um, it was mentioned in passing the idea of a parliamentary delegation, not just that. Um, you may be able to buy this on how easy that is, but I think in principle that would be a very good idea. I doubt that Pakistanis would agree to it, but even if they refuse, then you've scored a victory. You've exposed that Pakistan will not allow parliamentarians into Pakistan to see for themselves. So, can you just give us any advice about how you can? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's usually done through ATP yeah. or through. Um, uh, I mean, there's parliamentary union, um, which is um, international groups for different parliamentarians. That would be one. It's not something I have a lot of involvement in. That would be one way in which. So, um, well, well, yes, actually, I mean, the Commonwealth is another another area. I mean, how I first heard about the Blue Stain issue was actually at a Commonwealth, I don't remember what it was now, but a Commonwealth meeting. So, those inter parliamentary unions might be a way in because you, know, you suggest to parliamentarians they should go and look at this issue, and it's, so you need an organisation to go through. You can't just get half a dozen parliamentarians saying, hey, we'd like to do this. And, and the parliamentary union you already did the Commonwealth, so that would be one way of uh, approaching that. Yeah. I also just highlight the fact that am I correct that David Cameron is still a consultant and advisor on CPEC? No, on the BI thing for BI. BI. Yeah. Not CPEC, but on the BI, basically pushing the BI to the CPEC. That was, I don't do such a good but. Was pushing for you know, some, the big, big countries, and they were so high. Um, that's not what it's all about. That's good. It's a good thing. Yes. Sorry, so we don't talk too much about it. Well, and that's the very idea to investigate if David Cameron or any other British parliamentarian or ex parliamentarian is involved and speak to lobby there. Um, the final thing I just highlight is the imperative of. Dark units. The movement is so fragmented. There's so many different groups, um, some tribal, ethnic, and family and dynasty related, others political. Um, no divided movement ever wins anywhere. You have to seek your differences and work together. 
And I've said this many times, but getting unity around core agreed points, like some of the ones perhaps I've outlined tonight, that is the way forward. You look at, take West Papua, which is the um, Indonesian occupied part of New Guinea. Um, there they have disparate political movements, but they're all united under the United Liberation Movement of West Papua. All the different groups, tribal groupings, different groupings, ethnic groupings, and so on, they all come together under this one organization. And that gives them much greater clout. And they are getting slow. They started like you from nowhere. And now they're getting, you know, an international voice. It's slow, but they have credibility, which they never had before while they were fragmented. So I think unity, people being willing to think their differences around, you know, the basic six point that I outlined, we could all agree that release of the prison, you know, a seat to our, you know, patch down through the barracks, all those kind of things you can all agree on. You may have other differences, other disagreements, but we all agree on those four points. That's the base of which we work together. We're the same as our federation of apartheid. The United Democratic Front, which was the legal movement inside South Africa, apartheid, brought together all the disparate organizations, student groups, church organizations, trade unions, diverse political movements. They all came together in the United Democratic Front. And that's how they got power and influence. Unity is absolutely paramount. I, 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 if you hear a close talk, it doesn't mean that people can't talk. And I'm going to get to ask the name fairly quickly. This temptation to stay and talk forever, but that's unfair to our security people. But um, this, I think, you know, I'm going to just say a few words to finish up. We are out of time. But um, I, mean, I think what Peter just said about the message of unity is clearly absolutely crucial. I can see lots of putting heads around the room and that's something obviously to work on and it's never easy. Um, but you know, find what you can agree on and part whatever you may disagree on of society is really important. Just a couple of practical thoughts for me to finish on just because they occur to me. Um, again, I have no idea whether he's prepared to be prepared to pick up this cause but there is uh, a member of the House of Lords Lord Alton, David Alton, who used to be a Liberal Democrat and is now a prospect for a non-party person, who is very much seen as the House's champion of international human rights and has done a huge amount on particularly leaders and their so on whole. And I have no idea where he might fall in this or where he might have special interests, I don't know, but he'd certainly be someone worth approaching. And on that broader point, I think if you look at there's been a great deal of work in the House broadly across political involving lots of conservatives about the um, Chinese company from Huawei and their place in um, intelligence um, cameras, um, IT, um, and anyone who's worked on that. And this may be something that gives you an in. People who are concerned about the influence of China, they may not really have thought about Pakistan very much, but a lot of people have thought about the influence of China. And people who have thought about that may well be worth approaching in a broader sense. And also just to mention, to add to Peter's list about the arms trade, the campaign against the arms trade, the people who also got a lot of data and a lot of information and are respected of someone else you might like to look at to see what is being done in terms of that. So I think we've, in an hour and a half, got through a great deal. Um, there's obviously a huge amount to do. I've said that I will do what I can. I'm not going to make enormous promises, but I will do what I can. Um, and if you encounter something where you think particularly a written question would be useful, if you started to get some more support around the House, we could look at things like in the House of Lords, we have oral questions every day that starts the short 10 minute debate. And we can look at that down the track, but for that to work, you're going to need a range of people who have an interest in engagement. If I just put it down and no one else is paying attention, it will just kind of stick, which is not much point. So I think we start with written questions, getting other people involved, getting people involved with the comments, getting your local MPs involved. So I think the message here where I'm going to finish is, um, yes, you have to approach MPs and governments to work through them, but it's ultimately people in this group, hundreds, thousands of people like you, 
talking to people who are advocating for legal rights, for Hong Kong rights, for rights all around the world, for what's happening about what's happening with the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's bringing these things together that voices are much more powerful than when they're isolated and on their own. So you, know, you come here tonight, you're making politics what you do. This is a long-term project, but this is how political change happens. So thank you to everyone who's come along tonight. <laughs> All right, and I don't think we have got to the end of the question about email lists. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any arrangements for, for circulating contact with go. Not sure we ever got to an answer on that, which is an important question. I can't answer, but I don't know if someone can. Okay. Thank you. Um, can I suggest that someone, I don't know who, volunteer to say this is my email address if you'd like to be circulated, email that one person and make it circulate. Does anyone in that position do that? All right. I, 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 okay, so your, your email address would, you know, what the email address would be best? It's, it's on, it's on the, the, yeah. Okay, all right. So if you're happy to have it circulated, if you email them, <coughs> that can circulate and that will deal with the entire security. Okay. That's good. All the speakers are just looking better.